All right, all right. Good morning, church. How y'all doing today? Doing good? Wasn't worship uh, powerful this morning? My goodness, I felt like Jesus was leading worship. It was amazing. All right, some of you got it. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm Pastor David. Excited to be preaching uh, to you today. For those who don't know me, uh, along with my wife, we lead the, the youth uh, of City Life Church, the youth ministry, and we love it. We just had an amazing uh, youth party last Friday, and uh, I'm so happy and excited for what God is doing in uh, the young people in this city. Can I get an amen? amen. Um, it's amazing. Uh, people said that that would never happen, that would never work in San Francisco, but I guess God has some different plans, and I, I love it. Uh, for those who don't know me, yes, I am from uh, Brazil, and I moved to America when I was 12. And uh, when I was 12, I started sixth grade here in America, and they put me in a class. Uh, it's called ESL. You guys know what that stands for? Yeah, English as a second language, right? And the whole goal is to help students to learn English. But the problem was is that everybody in my class spoke Spanish because I grew up in Florida, so all my Puerto Rican friends, my Cuban friends, my Colombian friends, all, all the Latinos, uh, we spoke in Spanish. So even before I learned English, I learned Spanish. So English is my third language. So I'm warning all of you today, if I mispronounce a word or if I say something that is grammatically incorrect, just be patient with me, all right? It, it, it's not my first language, y'all. Anybody else is an ESL student here? Like, English is not your first language. You know my pain, so just laugh it off and say amen. It's all good. Cool? Cool. All right, let's jump into the Word because we've been uh, on this series that, I don't know about you, but th this whole season at the beginning of the year for me has been amazing. Uh, we've been on this, this, this theme of reset, and um, I don't know if all of you got a little book, a devotional book to help us out to kick off the year on the right foot. And I don't know about you, but I feel like my prayer life is getting better. My devotional time, my worship, everything comes from, from, from the secret place. Can I get an amen? amen? Everything comes from that devotional moment with God. Uh, that time that nobody's watching and you kind of can get a little uh, messy and, and emotional. And, you know, uh, we've been on this series and um, I'm loving it. I love it. I'm loving what God is doing. And it's definitely benefiting my life. And can I just encourage you with this? I know uh, uh, the book ended uh, yesterday, the 20th day. Keep going. Just because the book ended it doesn't mean it ends today or whatever. Okay, maybe I'm ahead. Uh, keep going with your devotional life. Keep going, pressing in into the things of God. And I know that this is going to be a great year, and I'm excited. So as you guys know, Pastor John, John uh, he kicked off the, the, the series talking about uh, uh, resetting our priorities. And last Sunday, he talked about resetting our focus. And today, I want to talk about resetting our faith, a faith reset. So if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Luke uh, chapter 8? We're going to read uh, verses 40 through 56. So Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, there's no condemnation. We'll show it on the screen. Just bring it next Sunday, all right? So this is what it says, verse 40. It says this, on the other side of the lake, crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered of 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him, and she had been immediately healed. Daughter... He said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, 
the leader of the synagogue, he told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. Verse 50, when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. You just have faith and she will be healed. Come on. That is good a good, good verse. Verse 51, when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, Get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. All right, let's pray as we invite the Holy Spirit to help us this morning. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for this church. Thank you for the city. Thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you, Lord, that you're already moving uh, in this uh, service today, God. Thank you, Lord, that your presence is everything that we want, God. Lord, we understand that uh, when we honor your name, when we get together, God, you show up in a big way. Thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, church is not about religion, but it's about relationship with you. So as we study scripture this morning, I just pray that you open our understanding, God. Let our spirits receive what you have for us, God. Let us leave encouraged, God, and full of faith, God. And I know, Lord, that you're going to touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. 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 Awesome. Isn't it funny uh, how people are so easily influenced by uh, popular belief in, in, in crowds or, or different circumstances? Like, have you noticed that, that like, people's opinions are always changing to, like, whatever is popular? Uh, whatever the, the culture is setting or trying to say, we're, we're trying to say, oh, you know what, it's actually true, or different things like that. And, uh, uh, at some point, you know, the whole earth believed that, that the earth was flat. At some point, everybody, you know, believed that there was no such thing as gluten. I'm just kidding. But uh, it's so funny that people's, people are influenced so much by crowds. And, you know, they, they say, oh, it's the mob mentality. Sometimes we see it. And uh, the other day, I, I, I was shopping at Target uh, with my wife, uh, the Target in Emeryville. Um, Hav calls it Emery Kill, and I'll tell you why. We're, 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 we're shopping at Target, and it's all good. I know I'm about to spend about two hours there because, you know, that's my wife's favorite store in the world. So I'm prayed up. I've already been fasting. I know it's going to be a minute. And um, we go to Target, and she needs to buy some, like, Christmas cards uh, to send it to her family. And I'm on a mission to buy a, a little trash for a kitchen. So uh, she goes to the cards, and I go in separate ways because I'm trying to save time and whatever. And I'm going towards the end of the store. Aaron stays at the front because that's where the cards are. And as I'm going to the end of the store, all of a sudden, I see people running. And at first, I thought, oh, maybe there's a crazy sale today that I didn't know about. <laughs> and then I hear people screaming. And then panic just came over me. I'm like, oh, snap. There's somebody with a gun or somebody going crazy. There's a fight. And then I'm like, where's Aaron? And I start running. I mean, I see people running. So you know what you do when you see people running. You start running with them to whatever direction they're running. You don't even get information. Like, what's going on? No, you run, and then you ask what is going on, right? So I'm running to the front of Target. I actually don't run like that. That looks weird. But I finally find Aaron, and I'm like, let's go. Let's go. Aaron, let's go. I'm panicking. And she's like, she's so focused on her Christmas card. She doesn't even know what's going on. Like, just people running. She's like, what's happening? I'm like, there's somebody with a gun in here. I don't know where he is. We need to hide. And I run to the front of the Target. And then we get some information. Actually, there was a shooting in the parking lot. And I'm like, then why are we running outside? Let's go to the back. So we start running to the back. And uh, we literally hide in the, the, the place where they, 
they keep all the stuff, you know, the storage compartment, and we're just hiding there. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to act cool and confident because I don't want to scare uh, my wife. So I'm like, yeah, no, it's all good. You know, it's like God, you know, has a prophetic destiny over us. There's nothing that's going to happen. And um, so uh, there's still stuff that we got to do in our lives, babe. Don't worry. God got this. I even started, like, uh, Snapchatting, you know, Instagram story. Like, hey, you're not going to believe what's going to happen. Mom, I love you. If we die, please. Um, and, and at first it was a good reaction, right? When people are running, you should run. Um, but after we're inside, uh, people started, like, panicking. And that's when you shouldn't uh, go with the flow because people are like, oh, my gosh, we're going to die. Oh, my gosh, what's happening? And I'm like, no, it's, it's all good. Like, the stuff is outside. We're safe here. And the, the Target <laughs> employees, God bless them, like, they have no idea what's going on either. They're hiding with us. And people are asking, what is happening? You have to know. And they're like, I'm not a manager. Like, I, I have no clue what is going on. There's a good, good point in life where we, yeah, we should follow the crowd, but there's also a point where you have to say, no, this is stupid. I don't have to panic like, like, like that. Today I want to talk about our faith because if we are honest with ourselves, at times we allowed our faith to follow the trend. At times we allowed our faith to follow the news, and we put our faith in different things besides God. Today I want to talk about resetting our faith so we can actually see a change. See, when it comes to faith, we cannot have a reactionary faith. Our faith cannot be influ easily influenced by circumstances, by a crowd, or by popular belief. Our faith must be influenced only by one person. His name is Jesus. Resetting our faith. Today I want to talk about resetting our faith. So, the question that comes to mind is like, okay, cool, I got this. I, I understand where you're going. But how do we reset our faith? How do we reset our faith? Because to be honest, this is a constant struggle in our Christian walk where sometimes we're full of faith and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're like, man, what is going on? I was so excited about this ministry. I was so excited about this person. and I, I was so excited about what God was doing in my job and in, in my family member. But now... Things are not going the way I want it. As we read this, the scripture, I, I, it's, it's a, fi, a, a fascinating scripture. And, I mean, the Bible it, it shows the, the, the same story in different books. In Mark, we see it in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And they give different perspectives on this. So later maybe you can check it out. But I love the fact that Jairus keeps it cool. As I was reading this story, I was, I was amazed at this guy's faith because a lot of people give uh, the woman with the issue of blood uh, a lot of credit, and she deserves it. I mean, she fought through the crowd, and she will see you, but a lot of times we don't talk about Jairus' faith. And today I want to talk about uh, three steps that I see in Jairus' life that allowed his faith to see the power of Jesus. See, why is this subject so uh, important for our lives as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus? Why is the topic of faith constantly being mentioned in the Bible? Well, because faith is how everything begins. See, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? So it's definitely an important subject, and I want to I wanna talk about it because I've, I, I really believe that today God is doing something in a lot of our faith and a lot of people's lives in the regard of faith. And I love what, what already happened right after worship as we opened the altar call and people are pressing in. I really believe that God is in the business of restoring things. And I really believe that today God is, is wanting to restore some people's faith. Amen. So as we dive in, I, I really want to encourage you to like be just examining yourself and say, God, what are the areas in my life where I need to... I need to be restored in. First thing that I see in Jairus' life, the first step that, that he takes is, is humbleness. See, Jairus, he had a, actually a great job. The Bible says that he was the, the leader of the synagogue. He was a respected man. Okay? He was well known in his community. He was making a difference. Uh, he, he, if he was a leader of the synagogue, this is where they, they study uh, uh, the Torah, this, this is where they, they will gather together as, as a community. 
So people knew who he was. People knew of him. But unfortunately, as, as life unfolds, his daughter, his only daughter, the Bible says, is sick. And he knows that there is no cure for it except to go to this guy named Jesus, who, whose fame was already spreading through the region. Rumors of him being the Messiah. People already respected him and called him a teacher. But Jairus' faith would forever be changed after he had an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus. And see, the, the first step that he has to take is to humble himself. A lot of times we, we want to know Jesus, when we, we want to, you know, have more of God in our lives, but sometimes if we're honest, we try to make God come to our terms. We try to have God come into our lives if he does that or if he, do, if he does this or if something happens, but that's not how it works. See, if, if you really want a change in your life, a change in your spiritual walk, can I just encourage you that it starts with a humble heart? It starts saying, God, I've tried it before without you, and I realize that I, I can't do this. It starts with a humble heart. I love what the Bible says because Jairus was in a desperate place. It says that he threw himself at Jesus' feet. Imagine what this implies. Because I bet that there was some religious people around there be judging him. Like, who, Jairus, come on, you're a leader, man. You teach the old school Bible, the Old Testament, man. Come on, what are you doing? We're not even sure if this is the Messiah for real. He didn't care. He was willing to put everything in the line, everything on the line, his reputation, his job, whatever, because he was in a desperate need for a de desperate miracle. His baby girl was dying, and he knew that Jesus was the only solution. So he humbled himself. He humbled himself. I love the Bible because the Bible says this. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There's always grace for the humble. Always grace. Never, God will never resist somebody that comes to him with a humble heart. He will never reject you. I love that, that what the Holy Spirit was already doing in the middle of the service because that's so biblical. Whenever we humble ourselves, say, God, I need you, he always responds. He will never turn you down when you have a humble heart. So in order to reset our faith, step one, humbleness. Are we humble? If we want to reset our faith, we have to humble ourselves and realize we depend on him. How many of you know this morning that you depend on God? Listen, I'm, I, I try to do life on my own terms and depend upon myself, and I quickly realize that, man, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Step number two, and this one is so basic that some of you will say, man, this is, uh, I heard this one before, but if we're honest with ourselves, we struggle with this. And step number two is trust in his word. Trust in his word. It's amazing to me. Put yourself in Jairus' shoes. You've been waiting for Jesus. He finally comes into your town and you're like, okay, I finally have the solution. My daughter's going to get healed. And uh, you're in a hurry, right? Because at any moment, you know she could pass away. So he humbles himself and he's like, desperate, Jesus, would you come to my house? And Jesus says, yeah, I'm down. You got some food too? Like, I'm, I'm down to go. <laughs> Jesus is on his way and he gets interrupted by somebody else. And somebody else gets the miracle. Have you ever found yourself in that place? Where you're praying for something? You're believing for something? You've been praying maybe even longer than the other person and it seems like everybody else is getting blessed but me. Put yourself in Jairus' shoes. His faith is being tested. His faith is being stretched. It's like, God, are you serious? Like, we got to go. Like, I, I don't know at any point she can be gone. Jesus, come on. It's cool that you healed this lady, but let's, let's go. Let's go. Uh... 
And at the same moment, as Jesus makes his way back to the house, after he healed somebody that Jesus didn't even pray for. That's amazing. Somebody comes with the news and says, Jairus, it's, it's, it's all good, man. It's, uh, it's over. I'm sorry. Uh, your, your daughter passed away. So there's no need to really have the teacher, the Messiah. Just leave Jesus alone, man. It's, it's done. What's funny is that Jesus already said that he was coming to his house. And I love what the Bible says because Jesus realized that this man just received the most terrible news a father can receive. His daughter, his only daughter, has passed away at the age of 12. Jesus heard, here's what happens. And can I just encourage you that God always hears when you hear bad news too. You're not alone. Sometimes we feel like, man, is, is God, does he even know that? Like what I just heard? He, he always hears. And I love what Jesus says. He says in verse 50, but when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jair- Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. At that moment, can you imagine what's going on through his, his mind, his heart? Jairus just saw an amazing miracle, but he also has the most terrible news right in front of him. And he has to make a choice. Am I going to choose to believe in what Jesus said, or am I going to choose to believe on the report that I have, the worst news ever? What am I going to trust in? And I love the fact that instead of saying, no, Jesus, that's, that's a good thought, that's, that's a good Man, bless your heart, Jesus. I, I, it's all good. It's, it's over. What's funny is that a lot of us, instead of saying, no, Jesus, yeah, I believe in your word. Let's come to my house. I believe you can hear. A lot of us, we choose the second option and just believe that it's over. Can I just encourage you this morning, church, that Jesus is reminding you this morning that it is and we're over? Can I just remind you that those areas that perhaps you thought they were dead, perhaps you thought, you know, there's no hope. There's no way a breakthrough can happen in in my job, in my finances, or in my marriage, or in my relationship with my dad or my mom or, or, or a daughter or a son. There's no way. Can I just encourage you today that his word is yes and amen. His promises are yes and amen. There's still time. I love this. So Jairus has to make a decision, and he chooses to believe. I find it amazing because it's always easier to believe when there's still a little bit of hope. But this guy had to believe when there's no more hope. I mean, they give him the verdict. is It's over. To believe when there's no hope. I wonder if a thought like this ran through his mind. Something that goes, well, God may have done it for that person or somebody else, but he won't do it to you or for you. There's no way. God, you're not good enough. Jesus ain't coming to your house. I wonder if those thoughts ran through his mind because he just saw a miracle happen to somebody else. And the enemy would love to come and bring doubt and say, you know what? I know that you've seen a miracle before. I know that you've seen healing and restoration in another family. But that was for them, not for you. Can I just break that lie off of you today? Can I just declare that all of God's promises are for you as well? Sometimes we compare ourselves. Sometimes we compare our lives to somebody else's. And God, how is it that it seems like you blessed that person and they got that and they got this. But what about me? Jesus still sees you. Jesus still cares for you. He still has a plan. He's on his way. What we have to do is trust in his word. Trust in his word. You know, I, I grew up as a, as a pastor's kid. Um, my parents have always been in ministry, and uh, they had a church in Brazil. And uh, after a while, they felt the call to come to America. But my mom, uh, she's a woman of faith, and I love her to death. And her testimony is amazing. Uh, I was actually talking to Hav about this, like our, our family's testimony. My mom didn't grow up in a Christian home. 
As a matter of fact, her mom uh, did a bunch of uh, like witchcraft and stuff like that. And uh, it's just crazy how uh, God can restore and save families. And my mom got saved at the age of 15. And when she first got saved, her parents were not cool with it. Like they were not allowed to go to church. They were not allowed to have a Bible in their home. So my sister, I mean, my mom and her sister, they had to sneak out of the house in order to go to church. I mean, they were radical. I guess you could say rebellious, but in a good way. And they were going to church. And uh, what's funny is that I remember since a little kid, we would always pray that grandma will find Jesus. Ever since we were little. I mean, as, as, as like four years old, five years old, always praying, God, we just pray. Every night that my mom would come and tuck me in in bed, what do you want to pray for? Oh, let's pray for grandma, that she will meet Jesus. And we prayed for over 20 years. 20 years believing God. I know that you, it's your promise that our family will be restored. It's your promise that you're going to see, you're going to do something amazing in her life, that she's going to realize that uh, the stuff that she's doing is not from you and that she needs to, an encounter with you. And a few years ago, my grandma got really sick. My mom had to fly to Brazil and she actually didn't even make it on time. My grandma passed away. And what gives me hope, though, what gives me joy is that on her deathbed, um, my mom's sister, my aunt, the oldest one, the one that got saved first and used to take my mom to church, she was able to lead my grandma to Christ on her deathbed. And I love this because God's timing is always perfect. He's never too late. He's never late. So the enemy might say, ah, God d did it for somebody else, but he's not going to do it for you. Can I just encourage you that Jesus says, I've done it before, and now it's your turn. Come on. Can you say that with me today? Like, he's done it before, and now it's my turn. Come on. Say it like you believe it. He's done it before, and now it's my turn. We got to put our trust in his word. Here's the third step, and I love this. Third step is you got to let the doubters go. you got to let the doubters go. I love this one because, actually, if you want to get picky, I'm like, David, Jairus, that wasn't Jairus. Yeah, you're correct. It was actually Jesus. <laughs> Jesus helps Jairus out because when we get to the home, people are already crying. People are already, you know, wailing, and they're, they're just like, in stress, they're just all their hope is gone, all the life of is gone, and they get there, and Jesus makes this bold declaration: "Stop the weeping. She isn't dead; she's only asleep." And I really feel this word today for some of you that there's areas in your life that you feel like are dead, but God is telling you, "No, it's not. It's only asleep." There's people that you think, "Man, there's no way they can come back." But I feel like God is saying, no, she's going to come back. He's going to come back. That opportunity is going to come back. I believe that God is in the business of restoration. That's what he's the, he does the best. Like, that's his, like, prime job. And I love that Jesus comes in, and he knew the, right, the, the people that needed to be in the room. Have you noticed that the, the Bible says that he only took with him three disciples? He didn't take Thomas, the doubter. Now, Thomas, you stay outside. <laughs> Whatever faith that, that's in here, you're going to suck it out of this room. Get out, bro. Go, go fast or something. Like, you need the reset book, son. 21 days of doubting, Thomas. He takes the three radical disciples. Of course he's going to take Peter because Peter believes anything. I love Peter. <laughs> Lord, can I walk on water? Yeah, do it. <laughs> Okay, Lord, save me. I love it. I can relate to Peter so much. I love that guy. There's hope. But Jesus brings the right people. Can I just encourage you that when your faith, when you're struggling in your faith, you've got to bring the right people into the mix. Stop going to the people that you already know what they're going to say, and they're going to say what you want to hear. They're going to, yeah, you're right. Don't go to church. It's a waste of time. They just want your money. It's just like, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, that person is done. There's no way. Yeah, just give up on them. Just move on. No. When your faith is struggling, when you need a reset, 
in your faith, you need to let the doubters go. And you need to get around some people that are going to stir something up in you. You need to get around some people that are going to encourage you. You need to get around some people that are going to say, you know what? This is what the doctor's report says, but we are with you. We are praying, and we're going to break through this. Let the doubters go. When your faith needs a reset, you got to call the right people. I love that the crowd laughed at him because they knew she was dead. The Bible says they knew that she was dead, but I have a feeling that they didn't know who Jesus was. I have a feeling that the same crowd that was laughing and mocking Jesus, have you ever been mocked before by your faith? The same people that were laughing are the same people that I guess they weren't around when Jesus had just healed the lady with the, the blood issue. I guess they weren't around when Jesus healed a paralyzed person. I guess they weren't allowed when they weren't around when Jesus healed a blind person. See, you got to have the right people around you. People that are going to build you up. People that sometimes will call you out. We hate it, but it's good. It's good for us. People that will encourage us and people that are going to get us back on track. They knew death, but they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know that he had just healed somebody that has been sick for 12 years. And now he was about to heal a 12-year-old who was dead. See the correlation there? Jesus can heal somebody's past, and he also can heal somebody's future. In the same story, he's able to heal somebody that was sick for 12 years and somebody that died after 12 years of age. Their future and their past was at hand. And Jesus has enough power to deal with both. He has enough power to deal with your past and enough power to set you up for a new future. So let the doubters go. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I really believe that this is a now word for us as we've been in this series of reset, resetting our priorities, resetting our focus, and now resetting our faith. Perhaps you found yourself this morning in a place where, to be honest, you never placed your faith in Jesus. Perhaps you never gave him a chance, and I believe that the Holy Spirit has already been speaking to you. So we're going to do a prayer. Everybody's going to repeat it. I'm not going to embarrass you or ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. But today you have an opportunity to say, you know what, Jesus, I need a faith reset. I need to reset some stuff in my life. So today you have that opportunity. And I'm going to lead you on this prayer. And would you just repeat it with me? Lord Jesus, today I thank you because it's a new day. Lord, today I choose to leave my old life behind, to repent from my sins, and to allow you to be my Lord and Savior. I choose to follow you, I choose to obey you, and I choose to love you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we make some noise for everybody that made that prayer for the first time? Awesome, awesome. I I just want to encourage you guys, if you made that prayer for the first time, we do have uh, a little gift that we want to give you. It's right by over there, the Fresh Start. Patty is amazing. She's going to hook you up with a gift, and we want to help you on this new journey with Jesus. Now, there is a second prayer that I I do want to pray today, and those are for us that perhaps we've been doing life with Jesus for a while, or perhaps we started maybe a year ago, but we've been kind of struggling, if we are honest. We've been kind of putting our faith in different things other than Jesus. And I really feel that God wants to remind us that uh, 2018 is our year, okay? And I know this is cliche, and it's like, Pastor, we say that every year. That's because we know Jesus, so every year is our year. But I do want to encourage you that God wants to restore our faith this morning. 
He wants us to go back to that first love. He wants us to go back to that place where, man, we, we believe in all his promises and then we can't wait to share with other people. So allow me just to do this final prayer over everybody. God, I thank you so much, God. Lord, I thank you that your word brings life. I bring, uh, thank you, Lord, that your word stirs up faith, God. That faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word. God, I pray that as we are on this journey of resetting, God, different things in our lives, I pray that our faith, Lord, will, 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 will receive a reset this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that every area in our lives that we have allowed doubt to come or we have allowed different opinions or, or just uh, the, the common belief or, or, or whatever people are saying, Lord, those areas that we allow the enemy to bring lies to us, God, that there's too hard, that it's too difficult, that it's never going to change. Lord, I pray that you change that in our lives. In Jesus' name, Lord, that you will restore our faith, God, our perfect faith, God, that you bring our faith back to the person that matters the most, that is Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and everybody say amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Have a blessed Sunday. If you want to hear more about our church and our, how to get involved, we do have a thing that we call Next Steps. Uh, Lama is going to be running that in the Cove today, so make sure you go there. Uh, we just want to talk to you and share our history. Amen? God bless you guys.